Hello and welcome to our first uh, Oxford Belarus Observatory webinar in the new year. As we are only 10 days into 2023, please allow me to wish you all a very happy new year. And let's hope that it is going to be a year of uh, positive and uh, peaceful change for all of us. My name is um, Elena Karistilova. I'm Professor of Politics and Global Sustainable Development at the University of Warwick, and I'm also a co-founder of Belarus, um, Oxford Belarus Observatory. So um, we begin our um, series uh, of webinars this year with the focus on the United Democratic Forces of Belarus, um, looking into their strategic agenda and the international support needed to bring about much needed change. Uh, please note that this is an extraordinary webinar not only because we are not having it in our usual kind of time day, which is normally Thursdays at three o'clock um, in the afternoon, uh, GMT, uh, but also because we have absolutely extraordinary set of speakers for this webinar um, uh, today. But before I introduce them to you, please allow me to say a few words about um, housekeeping issues. Uh, well, just to mention that the webinar will last one hour and 15 minutes in duration. Um, I may allow it to slightly run over time, uh, but uh, no more than by five minutes, depending on how discussion is going to develop. I invite speakers to speak for no more than um, seven, 10 minutes. Uh, and when, uh, please mute yourself when not speaking. This will be followed by a panel discussion and question and answer with the audience. And the audience, hello everyone, you're invited to post your questions um, either using the chat uh, function at the bottom of the screen or Q&A function uh, where speakers could also use the opportunity to respond to questions um, um, individually. The webinar is also um, uh, uh, has two working languages, English and Belarusian. Uh, so please do use interpretation button at the bottom of the screen um, as needed. The webinar is also live streamed on YouTube and the recording will be available thereafter for those who uh, may miss this discussion. Um, in addition to this, um, just to say that please do look at the Oxford Belarus Observatory website where you will find the full calendar of planned events for the year, including a book launch of Belarus in the 21st century in spring 2023, uh, where some members of this panel are actually contributing. Um, so um, now turning to the actual webinar. Um, it is my absolute pleasure and honor to introduce to you our speakers of the day and what a stel stellar panel we have today. Well, uh, we have uh, Svetlana Tikhanovska herself, national leader of Belarus and head of the United Transition Cabinet of the United Democratic Forces. We also have uh, Minister Urmas Reinsalu, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Estonia. And I'm told also one of our biggest fans as well. So hello, Minister, and welcome. We have Stephen Nix, Senior Regional Director of Eurasia, International Republican Institute. Hello. And we also have Professor David Marples, Distinguished University Professor of Russian and East European History, University of Alberta. Uh, so welcome to you all. Uh, perhaps just to give it this discussion some context. Um, as Svetlana Tikhanovska mentioned in her December address 2022, the year of 22 was perhaps one of the most difficult years in the history of the United Democratic Forces of Belarus. Not only did uh, many Belarusians continue to be jailed, persecuted, abused, displaced, uh, becoming international refugees, uh, there are also some new challenges that they face. Uh, well, one of them is how to stay connected with the domestic audience and also how to retain uh, attention and support on the international level. But yet again, all of these challenges now also need to be put in context in the context, context of the ongoing war um, and increasing involvement of Lukashenko's regime uh, in the war. We know that, that there have been now several rounds of sanctions uh, applied uh, to uh, Belarus and Russia, 
but um, yet Belarus and Russia, Russian economies uh, have not yet fully caved in. And we saw then even uh, that um, the increase in trade between Belarus and some of the EU member states, uh, which is a worrying sign. So I'll, um, my first question uh, will address to Svetlana. Um, in light of all these um, changes, um, both positive and negative, uh, what are the strategic priorities for the United Democratic Forces of Belarus 2023 going forward? What needs to be done to push uh, for real change, uh, especially domestically? And what kind of support we might need uh, uh, to kind of bring about the real change there? Svetlana, the floor is yours, please. So first of all, hello everyone. И привитание мои шановные белорусы. Thank you, Elena, for such introduction, for giving small context. And first of all, let me express my gratitude to Oxford Belarus Observatory for organizing this discussion and helping us to keep Belarus on uh, the international agenda. Uh, of course, I'm so glad to see among the participants, Minister Rain Salu. Uh, there, Udmas, you know that your personal involvement in the Belarus issue means a lot to us. You know that Estonia has also uh, shown incredible power of uh, empathy and solidarity, not only during the protests in 2020, but all the time uh, through uh, these two and a half difficult years. With your help, uh, repressed Belarusian students were able to uh, continue their studies in Estonia and the voice of uh, Free Belarus was heard in the UN General Assembly and UN Security Council. You know that we will never uh, forget get it. So, uh, dear friends, fellow speakers, um, as Elena said, uh, the situation in Belarus is worsening. Now we are fighting not only for uh, democracy, for democratic changes, but also for the very existence of our country. Uh, on one hand, uh, the regime is uh, increasing uh, political repressions against uh, Belarusian people. On the other hand, uh, Russia's occupation is uh, creeping further into our country. You know, as I speak, there are 20,000 Russian soldiers deployed in Belarus and new troops and military hardware arrive uh, and rotate all the time. Uh, although there are no direct military clash, uh, clashes in uh, Belarus right now, our territory is being used for Russian aggression uh, against Ukraine. And uh, desperate Lukashenko continues to give up Belarusian sovereignty to Russia in exchange for uh, political and financial support. And it's a big mistake to see uh, Lukashenko separately from Putin. I'm sure that together they bear full responsibility for war crimes uh, against Ukrainians and together they are responsible for uh, Belarus oppression. Meanwhile, it's uh, uh, crucial to distinguish Lukashenko's criminal regime from the Belarusian people who fearlessly fight for their freedom and uh, simultaneously support Ukraine uh, as much as we can in our situation. You know that surveys show that 86% of the population are against Belarusian participation in the war. Uh, if Putin and uh, Lukashenko uh, send Belarusian troops into Ukraine, we may expect uh, to see mass disobedience, maybe protests, and perhaps uh, the long-awaited split amongst, among the elites. You know, we saw how society reacted when the war uh, started. Spontaneous protests took uh, uh, place across the country. We saw uh, defections from among state apparatus and military. More than 80 acts of sabotage took place on the railways. Hundreds of our people volunteered to fight um, uh, with the Ukrainian army. And the Belarusian battalions have been engaged in frontline uh, combat uh, ever since. Uh, the level of repression also reflects the scale of resistance in Belarus. Only last year, the regime opened uh, about 5,000 or 50,000 uh, political motivated criminal cases, and many of them for anti-war protests. And on average, uh, 17, 15, 17 people were detained daily, and many of them have been sentenced to draconian prison terms of 5, 10, or even 15 years. And, uh, you know, uh, prisons in Belarus is a separate topic. Uh, it's like a 
torture chambers, actually. Political prisoners are humiliated, deprived of family um, visits or phone calls or medical treatments. Uh, let's remember Maria Kalesnikova's case and the visits of priests. And the goal is to destroy people morally and physically. And there is no exception for women, for minors or for seniors. Um, at least 25 people now in Belarus uh, prisons are in critical health conditions and need immediate treatment. And uh, the so-called trials became uh, actually routine. And one of them against Nobel Peace Prize laureate Alis Bilyatsky started last week. And no evidence against him was proved. Even Bilyatsky, uh, uh, even Bilyatsky request to conduct his trial in the Belarusian language was refused and no interpreter was provided. And yesterday, the trial against the editors of popular portal Tutbai started. And these events uh, represent Lukashenko's like, personal revenge for their dedication for, uh, to freedom or, and justice. And uh, the regime's uh, corrupt parliament continues to adopt laws restricting their population. Recently, it allowed to use the death penalty against uh, its political opponents. And it's also agreed to deprive citizenship and uh, seize the property of anyone who uh, dares to stand against it. Uh, but I have to say that despite the ongoing terror and the uh, repressions, Belarusians didn't give up. Uh, their resistance uh, became underground, uh, horizontal, and decentralized. Some people joined partisan groups or cyber partisans. Others, at great personal risk, uh, volunteer to get information about the movement of Russian troops, which helps uh, Ukrainians to prepare for possible attacks. And there is an underground network of Samizdat, self-made newspapers, made and distributed by uh, other people. You know, it's um, brave Belarusians will do anything to keep real facts and the truth available. And uh, despite all the regime's attempts to divide us, we have preserved the unity of democratic forces. You know that in August last year, we conducted the Congress of New Belarus and established the United Transitional Cabinet, which united major political groups and initiatives and became like the main executive body of uh, our movement. Our broader coalition also includes, of course, NGOs and independent trade unions and human rights defendant centers and, uh, you know, many, many organizations. You know, dear friends, today our main priorities are uh, to prevent Belarus from full participation in the war, to form an in international coalition in support for Belarus and to strengthen the resilience of Belarusian society. And we must maintain pressure to release political prisoners and uh, prepare the democratic transition of power. So maybe I will describe uh, priorities maybe a little bit deeper. I will not take a lot of your time. So priority number one um, is, uh, you know, in order to prevent Belarusian troops from entering the war and to help uh, Ukraine win, uh, we plan to intensify our inform uh, informational work and activities on the ground. We have to maximize the cause for Lukashenko in case he sends Belarusian troops or allows another attack from Belarusian territory. And the regime must be made aware of the consequences, including new and harsher sanctions from abroad and uh, popular uh, unrest at home. So what we need for this? The West needs to articulate these consequences forcefully and directly. It should demand the full and unconditional withdrawal of Russian troops from Belarusian territory. It should retrain, uh, or refrain from uh, official communication with Minsk and keep a policy of non-recognition. Uh, also support mechanisms to document regime's crimes, uh, war crimes and crimes against uh, Belarusians and uh, restore justice. We also ask for the assistance uh, to Belarusian civil society to be more flexible, uh, supporting our activists on the ground, independent media and bloggers. Priority number two is uh, uh, continue demanding their unconditional release of political prisoners and to support all those uh, repressed by the regime. Uh, Belarusians uh, who fight the regime mustn't uh, feel abandoned. So what we need for this? The democratic world should do more uh, to force Lukashenko's regime to release political hostages. Demands uh, must be um, 
present in every statement and in every resolution. You know, we also propose to establish an international trust fund in support of the repressed and their families. This money might be paid for lawyers, uh, support for families and rehabilitation programs for released political prisoners and for uh, their children. Uh, number three, priority. We aim to form a coalition of countries and mobilize international support for democratic Belarus. Belarusians who oppose the regime must feel the international support. We understand that the fates of Belarus and Ukraine are interlinked, uh, but we should not wait until uh, Ukrainians' victory. For sure, they will win. But we understand that change uh, in Belarus will also help Ukraine defeat Russia. Uh, free Belarus, as we say, uh, would be the worst sanctions against uh, Kremlin. And for this, uh, we need to adopt a proactive strategy towards Belarus, including a two-sided approach. Maximum pressure on the Lukashenko regime on the one side and support for Belarusian democratic movement on the other. Uh, it must raise the uh, Belarusian issue in international organizations such as Parliament, Council of Europe or OSCE and formalize, uh, if possible, uh, relations with Belarusian democratic forces as the true representatives of Belarusian people. Priority number four, we have to help Belarusians who fled and continue their work from exile. Those repressed NGOs, businesses, independent media and relocated to the European Union or Ukraine uh, to continue their activities need support. They face multiple challenges with visas, with legal status, uh, while um, at the same time the regime deprives them uh, of their uh, birthright, birth and citizenship. So uh, to you know, what we need for this, uh, we need to soften and speed up visa policies towards Belarusians who don't work with the regime, continue issuing visas in Belarus. This can be a matter of life or death when the KGB comes after you. Also, we ask to provide scholarships for students and uh, opportunities for relocated Belarusian businesses. Also, now we are asking, we are looking for a solution for those thousands who can be suddenly deprived of their birth and citizenship. Uh, you know, temporary documents might be a good step for this. Uh, number five priority is uh, to strengthen the, re the resilience of Belarusian society and maintain Belarusian national identity. It's rather a crucial question. We will continue to promote Belarusian culture, language, and history. Belarusians must know that they are part of Europe, but not the Russian world. And for this, we need to support uh, uh, for cultural, for educational initiatives, for civil society initiatives or youth exchanges. And Belarusians must be shown uh, their European perspective. And uh, finally, the prospect, uh, priority number six, uh, we continue to prepare for democratic transition and its possible scenarios. We have already drafted the new constitution, which will guarantee that no dictatorship can return in the, into, uh, in the future. And we are preparing laws on electoral, electoral process, economic, social and uh, judicial reforms. We also prepare the professional uh, reserves for New Belarus. Our plan is to have thousands of skilled and trained professionals that will rebuild our country. And for this, uh, we need uh, internships, fellowships, scholarships for Belarusian people. We also ask help uh, in preparing laws and reforms. We want to learn you know, from, from, from uh, the best. Actually, so uh, dear friends, you know, uh, in the end, uh, I urge not to put Lukashenko's regime and Belarusians in the same basket. If Lukashenko, who uh, it is Lukashenko who supports Putin, and it's Putin who supports Lukashenko's dictatorship, I urge you to refrain from simple but deeply harmful solutions such as visa ban on Belarusians, for example. It doesn't hurt the regime; it only hurts those trying to bring it down, the pro-democracy supporters from all uh, the Belarusian society. In 2020, Belarusians made a clear choice for democracy, and they continue to struggle for this choice. 
Belarus. Belarusians are a profoundly European nation with its long history of fighting for independence. And Belarusians don't um, associate themselves with Russian revenges. Belarusians see themselves in Europe and in the family of free uh, democratic nations. Sorry for taking too long time. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, I'm uh, looking forward for fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Svetlana. Thank you for outlining um, so clearly the six priorities for 2023 and obviously hopefully just for 2023 and uh, th th there will be no need uh, beyond uh, that year. But um, I guess looking at all these six priorities, um, in order to resolve them all, perhaps, uh, one important uh, condition is needed. Uh, that is a very robust information and communication campaign to raise awareness, including to reach to the audiences, uh, to the audience, uh, domestic audience in Belarus. And just a quick follow-up question then. Um, so how can we ensure, how can we reach people at home so that they're aware about potential consequences of going into war uh, in, in terms of, you know, how they need to stay resilient and so on. So what is uh, what the cabinet, but also the United Democratic Forces are doing in order to continue staying in touch with Belarusians at home? Uh, so to stay in touch with uh, Belarusians on the ground is also uh, our priority that maybe I haven't mentioned because we understand that the democratic forces who fled Belarus uh, will not do anything without people who had courage to stay on the ground and continue their resistance there. So uh, through uh, media, through personal communication, we uh, continue to keep in touch with the uh, people in uh, Belarus. Uh, so uh, personal for me, I have Zoom calls every week with the uh, people from Belarus. Everyone can call me. It's just uh, we can uh, coordinate our actions. We I can answer you know their questions. Uh, I go live on YouTube. We have a chat bot in Telegram. Everyone can ask questions and communication directly and safely. Our main task is uh, keep people uh, secure on the ground. You know, people are can be imprisoned when uh, they are communicating with people who fled Belarus. So we also uh, have, uh, have, as I said, network of volunteers uh, on the ground. About 2,000 people uh, we work with us on a daily basis and they promote our messages or work with people on the ground. Uh, also, uh, we have platform of solidarity. We communicate with major NGOs who have activists on the ground as well. Uh, also, recently, I met the leaders of parties who are still on the ground. There are labor units and um, uh, parties, though they lost legal status, but you know, uh, legal status is not about uh, um, uh, like uh, like status. It's about people. People uh, stay in Belarus, continue their work. So, uh, but of course, the main uh, method of communication is uh, media. While you are in Belarusian media, in alternative Belarusian media, uh, on international media, you are uh, uh, keeping in touch uh, with uh, Belarusians in such a way. Also, we uh, ha are the representatives in our transitional cabinet have their own structures, underground structures on the ground, like uh, Baipol has this Paramoga uh, plan, victory plan, who has a network of people, you know, communicating between each other. So we, of course, it's difficult, I have to say, to communicate with people thinking all the time about their security, but we have to do, uh, you know, we are trying to look for new forms of communication, new forms of uh, delivering our messages. And what's important, we have to communicate not only with uh, activists, with uh, people who are also standing for democratic changes, but also with like neutral uh, people or even with those who are on the side of the regime to uh, maybe not to attract them on our side, but to explain what's going on uh, in Belarus, what the consequences will be um, because of participation of Belarus in uh, these war crimes, uh, why, how 
war is connected with the economic situation in Belarus. But actually, most of Belarusians, look, they understand what's going on. They know who is guilty in uh, worsening um, uh, economic, economic situation uh, about sanctions. They don't blame uh, democratic forces or Western countries uh, in, in the sanctions. They know who is uh, guilty in all this. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Svetlana. And um, let's uh, perhaps turn to Minister Ryan Salo um, uh, as our next speaker um, uh, on the panel. Uh, Minister, how can and in fact should we support Belarus democratic forces in internationally? How can we ourselves lead by example, for example, to ensure unity and not just amongst the uh, United Democratic Forces, but also in Europe? So the floor is yours, Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, Madam Sikhanovskaya, all the friends uh, of uh, freedom of Belarus people and, uh, and uh, brave Belarusians. Um, let me first uh, wish that this year will be a year of victory uh, of, uh, of uh, um, freedom-loving Belarus people over dictatorship. And speaking about the list of to do in a practical context, well, uh, we can't uh, divide uh, the uh, situation on Russian-Ukrainian war out of the uh, future of Belarus and uh, all these immense threats what uh, Lukashenko intend to, uh, to, to continue uh, Belarus as his managed uh, puppet state of uh, Kremlin regime could continue, if anyhow, the outcome of uh, Russian-Ukrainian war will be ambivalent. And therefore, the first uh, call is indeed that uh, this year needs to be also a year of Ukrainian victory. And uh, that for when speaking about what the international community has to do to deliver more conventional weapons without any political caveats, uh, to deal with uh, issues of continuing political isolation of uh, Russia and also accountability and in a way uh, continue also with the positive support of uh, uh, Ukrainian accession into European Union, uh, into NATO and the plans of recovery. And by saying that, uh, surely it is, uh, I fully agree with Madame Tsihanovskaya uh, a statement that we need to avoid uh, of uh, further land forces involvement of Belarus uh, army into the war and therefore we need to give a clear support to democratic forces in Belarus. And how to do that? First, uh, we need to uh, continue uh, in political isolation of uh, Lukashenko regime. Now, uh, uh, Lukashenko regime is running also to get non-permanent status of Security Council membership in United Nations to the year 2024 uh, uh, from the Central and Eastern European countries group. We have got also a uh, competition. I proudly welcome uh, uh, Slovenia is also running and I hope all the freedom-loving countries will support Slovenia and uh, Lukashenko will lose uh, that uh, uh, battle. Secondly, uh, it is important uh, to keep uh, in all international fora agendas Belarus uh, question on the table. And uh, therefore, uh, I, I would mention OSCE, and I'm proud that uh, Estonia was uh, able to arrange together with democratic uh, uh, of uh, movement of Belarus together also and side uh, event in OSC foreign ministers meeting in, in last uh, December. Uh, secondly, uh, United Nations in general assembly level, but also by arranging uh, a uh, ARIA level, um, ARIA format meetings uh, in the margins of Security Council and also in a un, uh, in a European Union level. We just, uh, in the last uh, foreign ministers meeting uh, of the European Union, uh, we were pleased also to receive uh, Madame Tsikhanovskaya to take uh, 
to give an, an overview about the current situation. Uh, also, very important is to continue with further sanctioning of Belarus uh, and to avoid any kind of gaps to the current sanctioning system, which, could, which would give a certain uh, leverage and oxygen to uh, Lukashenko and uh, the power and business circle around him. And therefore, uh, a strong message uh, by Estonia, and I hope there is a lot of uh, like-minded countries, that we will continue implementing sanctions uh, simultaneously. As against uh, Russia, we will do it also against Belarus uh, regime. Also, very important uh, is an issue of accountability. There are uh, certain mechanisms how to uh, register the crimes uh, against humanity, uh, what uh, are committed against the uh, Belarus uh, people, the thousands of people being uh, under arrest. And uh, therefore, we need to give also a clear political message of the community of free uh, world that we will work uh, on the matter that our accountability will be uh, carried out. Uh, the people as top leadership of Belarus and also the people who are uh, in a mm, lowest level executing uh, these crimes against own uh, freedom loving people uh, will uh, be, uh, be stand uh, uh, on trial. And uh, what is important um, is of course uh, uh, to continue also in uh, Western countries to uh, tackle the uh, hybrid infops against democratic movement of Belarus. We should not make any illusions that KGB uh, of Belarus, FSB, uh, they are trying uh, to make any uh, actions to undermine uh, the authority of uh, uh, democratic movement, of transition government. And we should, uh, like, uh, to, to, to be let uh, not ourselves to be entrapped by these attempts. And they are working, uh, I'm sure, systematically on this uh, agenda. And also what is uh, very important is an uh, issue that is not recent, in a uh, recent past spoken a lot as a center point of gravity is now around uh, uh, Ukrainian war. We should keep also in mind and to have a vital debate on the uh, future after Lukashenko. Because we should, I think there is like a Siam um, twins are now Putin and uh, Lukashenko. And I'm sure that the harshest sanction against Putin's regime is a fall of Lukashenko. And secondly, also uh, symmetrically, uh, I would say that after uh, Russia has lost the war in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in Ukraine, it, is, it will be a time accelerator also uh, of fall of dictator Lukashenko. I'm, I'm fully uh, confident on that. And so, therefore, we need also, as we are, uh, mm, as Ukraine is a candidate state uh, uh, to European Union, uh, I think it is very vital to keep also a positive dialogue with the people representing democratic movement uh, of Belarus, uh, European Union, uh, Union member states, also about the uh, political future of uh, uh, Belarus, and about uh, the plan of uh, recovery after the fall of uh, Lukashenko. And this should be also the positive program should be st uh, uh, vitally on the um, table. And uh, um, these are my remarks. So it means uh, that the regime of Lukashenko should fall the democratic countries uh, should continue by political isolation, by sanctioning uh, to, to uh, support democratic movement. And uh, our message should be clear and steadfast that these people are accountable of these crimes against uh, humanity, against uh, Belarus people, will be uh, 
uh, accountable in future these crimes will be registered and uh, we are uh, uh, we are fully ready to support it and it means that in all uh, international fora discussions and debates about the future security architecture of Europe, there should be one precondition uh, of restoration of peace should, uh, should be also that uh, Kremlin has no any kind of influence to, uh, to dictate the future and way of life to its neighboring countries, to other European countries. And it would mean also, uh, I'm fully confident, uh, a new and a bright page in the, uh, in the future of, uh, of Belarus people. And uh, let me also stress that uh, after um, Estonia gave an um, opportunity of Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya to participate in UNGA meetings in Estonian delegation, it made uh, Lukashenko angry, and as a response to that, uh, he extradicted the Estonian ambassador. And uh, we answered by diplomatic, uh, uh, diplomatically, symmetrically. But uh, now I have decided also, and I have nominated also a special rep Estonian representative, uh, Estonian diplomat, Mr. Marko Koplima. Uh, to uh, democratic uh, movement, uh, he will be. Uh, he's going from the beginning of February to uh, uh, to be in in Vilnius, and I hope there is going to be also one uh, practical connection uh, um, uh, way uh, how we could uh, Estonia Belarus uh, democratic movement can, can share share the further activities, and uh, by concluding. Uh, I will just make a sentimental remark also that uh, I called the Estonian people also in the Christmas, in Estonian Christmas time, in the end of year, to write to uh, uh, Belarus political prisoners. And many Estonian people did it, and uh, it was truly, uh, let me strongly stress that the Estonian people uh, share um, all the pain uh, and all the, uh, and are. Uh, behind all this uh, bravery, what uh, people who uh, resist uh, this regime and want to see the future uh, free, uh, we are standing by them. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, dear Minister. Um, very impressive list of things to do, especially with regards to, to Belarus and how to support Belarus and obviously Ukraine and its fight, fight against Russia. So, and, and I'm quite taken by your pragmatic approach that you mentioned at the very beginning um, of your opening statement. So being pragmatic then, what out of this list of measures and priorities, which, uh, which one should be the first sort of on the top of the list in terms of being practical and pragmatic and implementable? Because at the moment we, we see a lot of actions, but not all of them are reaching the effect in dislodging the regime? Well, there are many actions what uh, Belarus people are also doing to support uh, Ukrainian victory. Uh, Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya mentioned uh, uh, this uh, brave uh, uh, military unit who is uh, uh, in, in uh, field combat uh, uh, also this I think this civic resistance of Belarus people, uh, by all means, what we have seen also to tackle the dictator, and gives also, I think, uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, thoughts uh, when, uh, when uh, uh, Lukashenko is pr pressured by Putin to enter by ground forces uh, to, the, uh, to the war. And so, therefore, I think or oh, the most important is indeed a practical support as moral but also by any practical means to democratic movement that uh, Lukashenko will see that uh, also and we are aware also uh, that uh, amongst uh, Belarus society is not any how popular idea to go uh, by, by land uh, forces to, uh, to, to war that uh, it will have outcomes which could uh, bring also uh, his power forward. 
I think this is a, of the uh, in the current situation uh, most practical issue to signal by uh, I think the Bel Belarus uh, democratic movement uh, the, that Lukashenko should avoid of doing that, but also signal in that context of uh, Western countries to support uh, democratic movement. Fantastic. Thank you very much, um, Minister. Um, well, I guess obviously solidarity and joint action also amongst the international supporters and the EU especially is, is very, very important. Um, let me then uh, move to our next, next speaker, um, Stephen Nix. And uh, Stephen, uh, from your kind of, with your hat uh, as a director, uh, your director for um, International Republican Institute, I wonder, what do you think are the missing, still uh, kind of missing variables in the international toolbox uh, of support for Belarusian democratic forces? Um, are they easily accessible? And um, especially for kind of domestic, or displaced activists. Uh, and what's new on, on the agenda for 2023 as well? Perhaps um, you could uh, take us through uh, this um, um, this new agenda as well, please. The floor is Jack yours. Jack you, Pani Elena, Jack you, Shanovni, Druzhi. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be on this panel with Svetlana and, and the minister and so many other important people. Uh, I'd like to say at the outset, uh, thank you, Minister Rensulu, for your remarks. I would like the audience to know that your country, Estonia, is the leader in terms of per capita assistance to Ukraine, both militarily and humanitarian. So we in Washington are also working to help Ukraine, but I want everyone to know the important role that your country has played in assisting Ukraine during this conflict. So thank you so much for that assistance. Uh, Pani Svetlana, thank you for outlining uh, the priorities. Uh, we're, we're in close contact with you, but it was nice to, to uh, hear those again. Uh, I'd like to start my present presentation with asking the, you know, the most essential question about what the democratic forces of Belarus need to do and what the West needs to do to support that. And that is the existential question is, how does an offshore movement like the Unified Democratic Forces of Belarus, how does this movement stay relevant in the current offshore position that they find themselves in? And consequently, flowing from that, how does the West, Western organizations, NGOs, Western governments, who are also offshore, how do we support this offshore movement while we ourselves are offshore? The essential question being, how do we continue to help the Unified Democratic Forces of Belarus remain relevant and responsive to the people who really count, the citizens who reside in Belarus. And before I, I try to answer that question, let me just give you some context as where we came from and where we are now. I'll start off first two years ago. The Democratic Forces ran a presidential campaign. It was successful. The next stage it found itself in was an anti-election protest movement, also very important. But now the movement in its, is in its third and most consequential stage. And that is a movement that provides both political support in country, but also provides leadership, governance. This is now a movement that has evolved into an alternative system of governance. And what does that mean? Svetlana and the democratic forces have evolved. They've done the right things. Uh, first and foremost, the creation of the cabinet, restructuring of the, the council. Again, all aligned and designed to provide governance and leadership to the people in Belarus. To define what Novaya Belarus really means to them on a day-to-day -day basis. Important steps have been taken. As Svetlana mentioned, a draft constitution was prepared. I was very proud and honored to be part of the working group organized by Svetlana and Anatoly Lebetko that drafted the constitution that we believe will govern Belarus in its transition period after the fall of the current regime. Very important steps, but it's not enough to draft the constitution. 
The next step is to transmit what that constitution means to the Belarusian people itself. Similarly, the new government, the new cabinet uh, that, that Svetlana and others lead has to come up with other uh, governance principles. What will the transition government stand for in terms of healthcare, environment, education? In other words, to define what a government would stand for once the transition takes place. And that is an important element in terms of developing these principles, these platforms and positions, and then transmitting them to the people of Belarus. I would also like to acknowledge that the uh, democratic forces completely changed their messaging regarding Russia at the outset of the conflict in Ukraine. Heretofore, the democratic forces had advocated for integration with the West, but also maintaining good economic and trade relations with Washington. And there's a reason for that. Reliable polling data told us in Svetlana and the forces that there was a certain element of their supporters that wanted to ensure good relations with Russia. All that was changed February 24th. The Democratic forces in Svetlana quickly turned and drastically changed their messaging, created the anti-war coalition, uh, creating an office in Kiev to try to integrate and work with uh, the government in Ukraine and also civil society in Ukraine. All very, very important steps showing that the democratic forces are flexible and cognizant of changing events and reacting accordingly. In terms of Western support, I think we go back to where we were in the post-election period when the West really stood up and helped create and stand up the movement in Vilnius, the headquarters in Vilnius. Uh, there are a lot of uh, financial costs and political costs to standing up a movement. The West responded to that call. Similarly, now that the cabinet has been formed, I believe it's the duty of the West to support this cabinet. Again, financially, politically, diplomatically, as the cabinet develops these positions and platforms that I described and transmits them, shares them with the Belarusian people. Uh, I'm, I'm going to try to be brief in my remarks. Uh, Long-term assistance, again, we have to help the democratic forces remain unified. I think they've taken important steps by virtue of the way the cabinet was formed, the way the council was restructured to unify the various components of the opposition. The West similarly has to remain united in its support for the democratic forces. Uh, again, unity among the West provides a great example to the opposition forces so that they can remain unified. Unity is essential to the success of this effort. And uh, again, in terms of your question uh, about missing variables for the West, Again, I think that continuing to help the opposition transmit messages, Svetlana outlined a number of things that are being done. There are other things that IRI is working with uh, the democratic forces that I can't describe in detail in this channel, but please uh, rest assured that we are working hard because we understand what a priority this is to enable the democratic forces to transmit messages in country. Uh, so we will continue to devote ourselves to that particular effort. And I'll close by saying, uh, not only will Ukraine be victorious in this war, and as Svetlana pointed out, Russia and Ukraine are intertwined. We fully expect victory for Ukraine, but also a transition in Belarus. And a final note is, as the minister pointed out, those responsible have to pay for what they've done. So we foresee a day when both Putin and Lukashenko are in the docket in The Hague to be responsible for their crimes against the Ukrainian people, against the Russian people, against the people of Belarus. Um, thank you very much, um, Stephen. Um, and thank you for kind of the reassurance and continued support and also for highlighting the contribution of Estonia to uh, um, uh, to providing uh, that kind of international uh, joint response uh, in support of Belarus. But 
the question here, um, I think I'll, I'll just use this opportunity, is um, now you've mentioned that help uh, democratic forces to be united, help the West to be united. But what are the practical steps in that sense that we can take? Because what we see, and uh, I think we can take it forward with David as well, um, that th there are pockets of excellence, but they're still fragmented. So how to bring that unity together? Uh, and also how to ensure that um, international support uh, continues uh, um, the same way, especially that, of course, a lot of attention is now being given to Ukraine, um, but how to ensure that Belarus is firmly on the agenda also in practical terms of international support. Stephen. Yes, uh, very important questions. First of all, uh, from the NGO standpoint, you know, we practitioners are meeting constantly in Vilnius to exchange information, to share what we are doing, to complement our efforts. So there's a lot of integration and unity among the NGOs that are offshore trying to assist the democratic forces. That will continue. Similarly, we're in touch with our State Department here, USAID, to coordinate assistance among governments. Again, this is important that uh, the US and our European allies coordinate on Belarus, not just on assistance, but as the minister pointed out, increased sanctions, which is an element I didn't get into, but want to underline now. Both sectoral and individual sanctions are important and should be extended. The sanctions that are in place now are important, but they're insufficient. They need to be expanded. And that's another part of Western assistance that I think is important. So we are in constant contact with our colleagues. Uh, we do travel to Brussels as well to brief and inform um, members of the European Parliament, representatives of the European Commission. So there's a coordinated US European effort as it relates to Belarus. Hopefully by this coordination, uh, this unity of purpose among the West will ensure in greater unity among the democratic opposition of Belarus. Thank you. Um, that uh, kind of uh, leads me very neatly to our um, uh, next speaker, uh, Professor David Marples. And David, with you, I would like to continue perhaps the same theme of um, uh, unity of um, democratic forces, uh, Belarusian democratic forces, but also international support. So perhaps if we can look at the first one first, especially in terms of relations between various elements of uh, the Belarusian democratic forces, because we have kind of different uh, parts to it, uh, including, of course, transition cabinet, that is council, the, uh, the, 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 those fighting in Ukraine, but also, um, but also uh, other uh, parts to democratic forces. What needs to be done to bring these forces uh, all together and how they can be supported in their kind of overall struggle for free Belarus? Please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you also for the invitation. Greetings to fellow panelists. Hello to Svetlana, who I met quite recently. Nice to see you again. Um, I'm speaking more from a from an academic perspective rather than a, a diplomatic one, but um, it's also a pattern as an historian that we've seen several times throughout the Lukashenko leadership, going all the way back perhaps to 1999, when this was the key question, how to unite the democratic forces. Um, and I think the relations between the various elements of the opposition, uh, the transitional cabinet, those fighting in Ukraine, Kalinovsky Brigade, also the traditional opposition parties who've been around since the early 1990s, um, Often they're divided at critical times and it's always been difficult to coordinate this opposition. I felt that the election campaign that was mounted by Svetlana was especially effective because it took a fairly neutral attitude to future choices of the Belarusian people. And that's not to say that I favored uh, particularly that route, but the fact is that the Belarusian people are not yet 
ready to embrace democracy or let's say the European way or even Western way. It's just a fact. I mean, if you simply look at any poll, most Belarusians favor close relations with Russia. And the reason I think is that they're bombarded daily with propaganda from various government sources on YouTube. The press is almost entirely dominated by the regime and by Moscow. So the population of Belarus is not getting news from outside these two sources. It did before, and it was mentioned by Svetlana that the two by are on trial today in, in Belarus. There was one outlet, for example, where you could get alternative views. And there are a few others, but in fact, most Belarusians are not getting them, whereas they were maybe five years ago, 10 years ago. So I think the information war is absolutely critical, not only to unite in the opposition, but also for informing Belarusian people of what is really going on outside the Republic. I think that is critical. And the second thing I would like to mention is, I don't adhere to the view that you can simply ignore Russia after the war ends, where Putin is gone, we hope Lukashenko goes to, but what will replace them? Will Russia suddenly emerge as a democratic state? I think it's extremely unlikely if you look at Russia's past. Uh, the times when you've had real democracy in Belarus are a matter of months in the 20th century, for example, um, 1917 for a while, maybe late Gorbachev period, but overall, Russia's tendency towards authoritarianism, I think, is going to be repeated in the future. You cannot kind of ignore the elephant next door. Like in Canada, we cannot ignore what's happening in the United States. So I would like really to stress that somehow a future regime in Belarus has to work with Russia to some extent. And I don't think you can sort of dispense with that and say it will be entirely Western oriented in the future. I realize that's not a popular, <laughs> a popular thing to say. But um, I would say also that the question came up earlier of, of um, identity and study in Belarus. And I think that's a critical question. And if we look at North America and compare Belarus and Ukraine, I mean, there are literally dozens of institutes studying Ukraine in the United States and Canada. There are several specifically Ukrainian institutes largely funded by the Ukrainian community. What has Belarus got? It's got one center for Belarusian studies in Winfield, Kansas, and I haven't heard from them in the last two years that they're actually doing anything. On Facebook, I run a North American Association for Belarusian Studies. Um, we have about 500 members, which I think is reasonably good. Um, but we used to have an active organization, and we don't have one right now. And I think it's very important to make sure that we do have them. And we do have a long-term center for Belarus in somewhere like Washington, New York, Toronto, it can't be in Winfield, Kansas. It's got to be somewhere very central and very close to the main sources of information in the Western world. And for me, that is something to aim for in the future. I think it's achievable, but right now it's not got off the ground. Information is the key, whether it's social media, YouTube channels, for example. This is where we can inform the Belarusian people of a different perspective of the world today, and one that's not dominated by Moscow or these hoodlums that have taken power in Minsk since 2020. I realize we're not got much time, so I will stop there. Thank you, David, uh, and thank you for being um, uh, provocative uh, in, 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 in that sense. And I agree, information is a key, and I think this should be the question to all of us in the sense of, um, what can we do really in practical terms in order to ensure that that information, you know, information, real information about what is happening actually penetrates Belarus in terms of uh, helping Belarusians to understand the consequences of their participation in the war in terms of maintaining and growing their identity and not just about the centers that could be, you know, set up abroad, but also in terms of, you um, helping Belarusians shape their identity also domestically. 
Um, perhaps there is a question whether what what can we learn from how displaced Ukrainians also uh, do it abroad in terms of supporting and maintaining their identity. Um, so I think I will open this floor to all of the speakers in terms of practical measures, in terms of uh, improving information flow, uh, flows to, uh, uh, to inside the country, but also in terms of putting Belarus uh, more loudly on the agenda uh, and, and providing more information about Belarus in terms of shaping identity and shaping the understanding uh, of Belarus internationally. Um, perhaps, uh, shall we go to um, Svetlana first with this question? Um, what can we learn and what could we do in practical terms in order to ensure that information um, and communication about Belarus um, continues? both on global level, but also uh, um, in terms of, well, domestically, in terms of penetrating the country. Uh, so first of all, on national levels in different countries, I urge governments and parliaments and people and media to uh, communicate more with Belarus and diaspora all over the world. Actually, uh, it is evident that in 2020, uh, random people, Belarusians all over the world, they organized into communities, organized into diasporas. And actually, um, uh, people started to be vocal about Belarus. People started to be proud that I'm Belarusian. And it's very important now to uh, give these people attention, to show that you are important. We are working with you. To I call media to uh, invite uh, representatives of Belarus and diaspora on interviews. Through interviews, through media, of course, it's our main tool. It's very easy to spread the idea of uh, Belarusians, to explain ordinary people that Belarus is not Russia, that Belarus is a European uh, country, and that Belarusians made the choice. Because if politicians or um, uh, okay, politicians understand more or less what's going on in our country. People don't realize, you know, they saw this beautiful uprisings in 2020, then uh, everything uh, disappeared, this beautiful picture, and people forgot about us. But it's important to, to, to talk to people first of all, because will of people influence uh, political will of uh, politicians. Uh, as for uh, how to reach uh, people in Belarus. I understand that it's very important to communicate with people, to educate people, what democracy is, what uh, our allies and partners are doing to, uh, you know, to keep Belarus on agenda. Uh, it's important to support alternative media who have been deprived of their right to broadcast openly in Belarus and had to and have to survive uh, in exile at the moment. So the role of media cannot be um, over overestimated. Yeah, and so uh, bloggers, YouTube, uh, Instagram, you know, all these alternative alternative uh, tools that we have, uh, it's important to use all of them and to support all of them. We understand that propaganda uh, has, uh, propaganda in Belarus has uh, wider opportunities to brainwash people through TV, uh, through also YouTube. Uh, they... Um, uh, block uh, uh, they block uh, a lot of alternative information uh, through declaring them uh, extremists or terrorists or so ever people are afraid to uh, to watch or read something but uh, I, I think with the support of international uh, organizations with international um, uh, assistance you know we can build uh, stronger, media holdings or media channels that uh, will find the way how to provide this information to uh, Belarusian people. Thank you very much, Svetlana. Would anyone else from the speakers uh, like to add to that? There is a question also from um, the Lithuanian amb uh, ambassador in London, uh, Bayronis, about how to keep Belarus question in the public and expert discourse in the West, how to sustain it and in fact make it as loud as that of Ukraine. 
Um, perhaps, um, Minister, uh, if you would like to go first. Yes, thank you. Well, referring to the uh, latter question, let me say it is very important indeed is to give leverage to transition government, to democratic movement. And so it means that our attempt, like-minded countries' attempt should be, that in every public fora where there is a representative of Lukashenko regime there uh, formally uh, around the table, there should be also uh, 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 also uh, in any modus operandi how is it could be achievable uh, also a representative of uh, transition government and secondly it is very important uh, this uh, concept uh, and i very much encourage every country to to uh, develop it as uh, this concept of representatives sending the representatives or nom nominating by uh, transition government representatives to the other uh, uh, countries and also sending particular uh, uh, diplomats uh, to be a liaisons and to cooperate uh, to a transition government. And also this concept of information centers is uh, very important. We know how the Czech, we are now studying in Estonia about opportunities also to follow this model uh, of the list like a center uh, of uh, as uh, Czech Republic has opened in, in Prague. And I think uh, this should be an option to do uh, in a wider perspective as to uh, rise the uh, knowledge of public uh, in these countries, but also to coordinate actions and to keep uh, the sentiment uh, of uh, Belarus diaspora, which was also mentioned. And of course, this uh, offshore uh, approach needs uh, a certain um, asymmetrical ways of support by any donor countries. But uh, there is a lot, uh, lot of practical things uh, which need to be done uh, further. And so about the, uh, the Mr. Ambassador's question about keeping the uh, uh, Belarus issue on the table, well, uh, the only way uh, in a political level of international relations to do it is uh, that it should be uh, in the priority list of like-minded uh, countries uh, who are, and I think uh, there is a instinctive uh, uh, sympathy and readiness to do that uh, amongst uh, particularly these countries who we uh, see as also the most devoted uh, supporters uh, of, uh, of Ukrainian victory. So it is, as I said, very uh, interlinked issue as we uh, see uh, things taking place. And uh, I uh, I would put the things to the perspective, well, in a biblical terms, have we seen this last one that uh, which was impossible became possible, and it means also uh, uh, which has been used to be uh, possible, could turn to be impossible. So uh, we are now in right now creating future, um, how painful it uh, doesn't uh, feel uh, to our current generation current peoples uh, to pass it in Europe. And it, makes, it means that it, nothing is not uh, like predestined. N nothing is predestined. And so it means that our effort uh, as we to, to stand for what we believe uh, is of vital importance, of vital importance, because we, uh, we are now creating precedents. And also the precedents, what we as, uh, uh, as generation are worth of. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. I absolutely agree, especially with the idea of setting up um, um, information centers, uh, for example, in, in especially in European uh, uh, countries, but also in the, um, in the States uh, and Canada, uh, simply because it would give um, perhaps uh, more information about what is happening in Belarus, including since 2020, but also will perhaps act as a rallying point of kind of like a magnet, uh, bringing diaspora together, 
in order to globalize in their agency, that would be very helpful. But going beyond these information centers, uh, I think we, we have these voices, Belarusian voices, which unfortunately are kind of dispersed around the globe. Uh, how to integrate them, to give them more purchasing power. I think that is a very big and valid question. I think David uh, kind of uh, began uh, with uh, kind of discussing or putting it on the table. So uh, are, are there any ideas uh, how we can ensure that bigger, more global purchasing power? So the voice of Belarus, perhaps through Belarusian diaspora will become bigger. Anyone? Well, I think in the past Maybe. we had, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I mean, even, even today you've got things like Belsat and um, mm -hmm. Radio Liberty Svoboda um, station, which is quite effective. Um, um, if you could get this on a, on a broader scale to cover, let's say the Western world generally, North America generally, uh, I think it would be quite effective. And there used to also be, a, for, for many, many years, a, a Belarusian review um, that came out of California. And I think then it was moved to Prague. Um, unfortunately, that eventually stopped as well. I mean, there have been sources in the past of information on, on Belarus. Um, the diaspora is small compared to the Ukrainian one in, in North America. There's no question about that, but it, it could still be a much louder voice um mm -hmm. and yeah i keep seeing questions in 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 the chat about um people in 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 belarus and what they think about russia i, I would just say that you know when i mentioned that about what belarusians think i was thinking of opinion polls of uh, vadimatsky for example and chatham house which suggest that although Belarusians are very much opposed to fighting in the war through the Belarusian army being sent into the war, their attitude to Russia is somewhat ambivalent and um, at the moment, you know, and, and may remain that way. That's all. But okay. Thank you very much, David. Um, and Stephen, would you like anything to add to this? Yes, just to address the, the current discussion, uh, I'll just re-emphasize my previous remarks. Uh, the diaspora is important. Um, other elements of the opposition are important. We think that the key element is the people who reside in Belarus. Consequently, it follows that the most important priority, and Svetlana outlined six very important priorities. To us, the key is to enable an offshore movement, the Democratic Forces of Belarus, to transmit messages in country to the people that matter the most the citizens who reside in Belarus, and not just transmit any messages, but messages about what the movement stands for and what a transitional Belarus would stand for in terms of the policies and platforms uh, that I outlined earlier. Uh, this, I think, is the essential uh, question on Belarus. How does the West, in terms of our uh, offshore uh, situation, continue to assist a movement that is offshore to effectively communicate with the citizens of Belarus. Again, where I'm all for academic freedom and exchanges, uh, but I'm a practitioner. And uh, I think the most important element right now is nislovam adjelam, not words, but deeds. And that's what IRI is committed to doing in Belarus. We will encourage others to do the same. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that clearly, uh, emphasizes how important, you know, that indeed, not just words, but actions. And in that sense, um, um, I will now perhaps uh, pick up some questions from, from the chat uh, box, especially. Uh, somebody mentioned here that there are about, uh, there are quite a, quite a few people's um, embassies set up around the globe since 2020 um, in different countries. How are they supported? Uh, and how can they perhaps be more closely integrated with uh, the, the new structures that uh, have been introduced to transition forces or the United Democratic Forces? Perhaps, Svetlana, that's the question to you. Uh, it was a question about people's embassies. Yes. 
Oh yeah, uh, just uh, a little of context. <laughs> you know, we Belarus and uh, Belarusians all over the world they organize so-called people's embassies. When uh, we understood that uh, ordinary embassies they are not fulfilling their duties, they are not protecting the Belarusians, uh, they are not promoting the ideas of democratic Belarus. Uh, people uh, in diaspora organized uh, so-called people's embassies, and actually maybe I will use this uh, opportunity and say a huge thank you to. So uh, all the uh, embassies, all the people, the diaspora all over the world for uh, working on new Belarus. I understand that it's difficult, it's difficult to knock hundreds of doors and uh, perhaps one uh, door will be open for them, but they are doing this for two and a half years and, uh, you know, they are promoting uh, our country. So I uh, I think that it's very important for politicians to work with these people, not to uh, think about them as, uh, uh, you know, some Belarusians. It's people who uh, demonstrate Belarusian Belarusians will, uh, free Belarusians will. And, uh, you know, they are doing a really great job. And uh, I hear, I, if I may ask support for people's, people's embassies in different countries, it will be uh, very important for them. Because if they see that they are not uh, forgotten, that they are important, that they can, they can do something in every particular country, they really uh, inspired by this. And it gives them energy to continue their work uh, that uh, you know, open new and new doors, and uh, you know, you know, work for for changes uh, in our country. Okay, that, that's fantastic. Thank you. So perhaps connecting those Belarusian um, uh, embassies with information centers as well, so that this way, you know, it can take a kind of a new lease of life in terms of spreading the word about Belarusian culture. Uh, and making the voice of Belarusians louder, especially abroad. So information is clearly the key. And I can see that we're coming to the end of this discussion and I wish we could have all hours at our disposal to continue this very exciting topic um, further. But um, alas, we, we're coming to an end. And um, with that, um, I would like to thank all the panelists for their um, insightful uh, contribution to the, this discussion and for giving us your time. I know that uh, that time is the most precious commodity and thank you very much for your thoughts as to how uh, Belarus, um, well, the priorities uh, of the United Democratic Forces and how Belarus could be supported internationally. I would like to end um, this discussion with... Um, the words from Svetlana's yet again, from Svetlana's New Year's address, if I may, again, um, which I think actually resonates with uh, what we've discussed already today. And um, here are the words. You all do incredible job. You build a life despite. You raise free and talented children despite. You stay kind and affectionate despite. This alone is a reason to be proud of, and from me, to keep going. So, Jive Belarus, and thank you very much for your attention. Just to mention, our next time uh, in the air is on the 2nd of February at 3 o'clock GMT, uh, and we will focus, actually, on Belarusian diaspora challenges and opportunities. With that, I would like to thank you all once again for this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Живи. Живи.